Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Best of Pedal Shift. On this edition, we go all the way back to September 2015 to conclude our revisiting of Pedal Shift Tour Journals Volume 4 with a follow up episode, which was a portion of Pedal Shift Project 029, which, by the way, also is worth checking out because uh, I did something about bicycle touring all 50 states, which uh, 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 all the different states that I've, I've visited, which was actually kind of a fun listen. And there was uh, some great old school news about Amtrak and bikes, which, of course, you know, Amtrak has become much better about now. But in this episode, we, of course, talk all about the takeaways from the things that we've been listening to over the course of the last few months around this transit aided ride. And I think that the biggest takeaway I think you all know is how much I've integrated transit as a fast forward opportunity and some other things uh, into more traditional, more bicycling related (laughs) trips that I've done. So I think this was a good uh, listen. I think this was a great adventure. And like I said, I think that I'm going to try try to do something similar to this this year. It's in, it's in my goals. We've talked about that, but more to come on all of that. Until then, let's listen back to episode 029. Got a few things in this episode for follow-up, and the first, of course, is going to be kind of a little post-transit-aided tour digest, if you will. Just sort of my takeaways from this really wacky tour that I undertook. Here are some thoughts that I have about how that all went. The idea behind it was all the cities of the Northeast U.S. are really close together. And I thought it would be really interesting to see if I could string together with a folding bike and these very close together transit systems to see if I could travel some real distances. So I linked together all the bus and train routes for all the local cities and their regional transit partners to see what I could do. And it turns out you can go from Washington, D.C. to Boston in a 24 hour period, roughly, and do it with a folding bike and this transit, these transit systems. I think it was 11 separate ways of doing it and some short riding in between some of these points. And it was really kind of cool. And I, I got some fun pictures along the way. I met some interesting people. A lot of people thought I was crazy, me included, I think. But it was a really interesting, I don't know, proof of concept more than anything else. And I wanted to share what my takeaways were. I found After I got back and I got back, you know, after an overnight train Amtrak trip back that it took me a while to kind of figure out how I felt about everything. And that sort of made some sense to me because I was so sleep deprived. That comes in one of my takeaways here. But the idea here is that I think that I learned a lot from this trip, just like I learn a lot from most of my bike tours. But this one in particular, I think that there's some real interesting things that I can apply to future tours, whether or not they're on a folding bike and whether or not they use transit at all. So here we go. First up is I love the Dayhan. That's my folding bike, but I'm getting a Brompton. And the reason behind that is pretty simple. The Dayhan's a great bike. It is best. And this is the Dayhan. I believe it's the D7 HG. It's got a internal hub. It's got seven speeds. It's it folds really nicely. It's on 20 inch wheels. It's a great bike. It's a little bit heavy. It doesn't fold as tightly as a Brompton. And it certainly isn't geared for hilly touring. And for the riding that I was doing, particularly the 22 miles or so between Perryville, Maryland and Newark, Delaware, there weren't really hills of note. It was a relatively flat ride. There were some hills. I think my max up and down was maybe a couple hundred feet. Certainly nothing in the realm of bike touring that's much. But there was one instance where I had to get off and push. And that's something that I prefer not to do. But I actually kind of thought that it worked pretty well for a real flat ride. I don't think that a folding bike is a really great idea for off-road riding. So I think that folding bikes are best for road. That being said, I've seen people use folding bikes on the CNO and on the Gap before. So I I think that my hesitation perhaps to say that this is only going to be for road touring is one that may be a little bit misplaced. We'll have to see how it all goes. But ultimately, I think the Brompton is, especially when you get it geared properly, like I will be doing, is just a a flat out better touring bike. I think the Dayhan's an excellent bike. I think it, it was a great starter bike, and I'm really glad that I got it. It was inexpensive relative to Bromptons and Bike Fridays and things like that. But I think if you're looking at a folding bike for touring, I wouldn't I wouldn't say don't look at the Dayhan, but I would also say 
you may want to try to ride or borrow a Brompton first. Consider that because in some ways I regret spending the money on the Dehan last year. And although I'll be selling it and maybe recovering some of that, I think I would have been better off ultimately knowing what I know now to getting the Brompton just because I know that I want to use the bike more for touring, or at least I want that as an option. And then also, in addition to that, the Brompton actually is better for folding up and putting into, say, airplane overhead compartments. It travels better than day hunts, just a little bit too big for that. On this ride, I found it to be great. I found it, it, it worked really well. I expected it to be too heavy for me, and in the end, it really wasn't. It was heavier than I would have liked, but I thought it was a really good option. And it was also really interesting, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a later takeaway, that it also works in the front bike rack of municipal buses as well, which was a big of a surprise for me. In fact, it was something I didn't know whether it would work or not. And thankfully it did because I was in a point, as we'll discover in a little bit, that I, I was sort of stuck having to do that. And my intention was to bring it with me inside all of these various transit conveyances. So Dayhan gets a thumbs up, but eventually, and probably this fall, I'll be getting a Brompton. Next to takeaway. Transit in the Northeast U.S. is pretty reliable, and I recognize that it's a pretty small sample size. I think that there are certain systems within the transit systems of the U.S. that are absolutely overloaded and choked. I managed to, because of the timing of all of this, I traveled very early in the rush hour period, and then I got on trains and buses that were sort of distance haulers during the real heart of rush hour. I avoided a lot of the real pinch points in some of these cities. And when you avoid those pitch points, the U.S. transit system, at least in the Northeast, at least on that day, it was pretty good and it was pretty reliable. I didn't feel like I was in any risk of missing any of my connections at any point. And that honestly was a big surprise. I sort of thought there'd be a moment of drama where I'd be running or rushing or riding or really trying to, to stress out to make a connection. And I didn't have that a single time. So that was a bit of a surprise and it was a pleasant one as well. Next one. New York City, particularly 8th Avenue, it's a really challenging place to ride, but it's awesome. So if I have any New York City listeners, my head is off to you for riding in the city. I think it's pretty cool. It's definitely a great way to get around Manhattan and per probably the outer boroughs as well. But I really enjoyed it. It was tight. It was crowded. I was sharing the road very closely with other motor vehicles, but because the taxis in particular and everyone was moving at a very slow pace. I think people were looking out for each other and it was really interesting. If you're not into riding really close to motorized vehicles, New York City's not your jam. <laughs> it is definitely not. I am a pretty experienced urban rider and I have to admit I was a little bit, um, oh, I don't want to say stressed, but I was definitely more alert than I normally would be. And uh, maybe it was just because it was a, I, I was in an unfamiliar biking area because I've been to New York many, many, many times. But uh, biking, it was a new experience for me. So awesome, but challenging. Next takeaway from the tour, just because you can do it doesn't mean it's a good tour. And I, I say that with a caveat that, yes, I enjoyed this, but I think sometimes we create challenges and we say we like to go out and do things because they're there. I think I talked about that in the Pedal Shift Tour Journals of Volume 4. The one thing that I would say about this is that it was really interesting. I don't think I'll ever do it like this again. Maybe I could conceivably look to doing some travel that's transit aided in the future. But I think that just the breakneck pace that I did with this particular trip, it wasn't as enjoyable as it could. I certainly covered a lot of miles as a result of it. But I think that there were a lot of other downsides, and I'll talk about one of those in a moment. But I think that sometimes experimental things are experimental for a reason, and this was definitely one of them. I enjoyed it. I don't think I would ever do a tour like this, quite like this again. I'd borrow some elements. This was pretty extreme. Next up, lighter and smaller for the win. I don't recall doing any kind of an overnight tour where I carried less gear than I did on this one. If you look on last episode's kind of preview of this entire ride, you'll see how small I was packed down. Now, I'm used to a really traditional sort of heavy load setup where I've got a couple of panniers, a larger dry bag on top, a rack bag, 
I guess is what you'd call it. And then on front, I have a, a sort of a platform rack with sleeping kit and things like that as well. In fact, if you've signed up for the Pedal Shift newsletter, you've seen how I do a recommended pack guide. I might be changing that at some point in the future because I have to say going super light was a really, really, really big revelation for me. And I suppose that's sort of file under dub, but at the same time, doing the ride and moving around on a bike that frankly isn't built for really heavy touring was sort of surprising, even though I, I shouldn't have been surprised. I thought that it was a really good ride and it was nice to have everything that I needed, yet nothing extra. And that's really going to be a good takeaway for future tours, because frankly, I still carry too much stuff, I think. It's nice to have everything you need, and it's nice to maybe have every single tool that you could ever possibly imagine needing to fix everything under the sun. But for me, I found, you know, 99% of the time, the most crazy type of repair that I would need to do, frankly, can be handled with a small toolkit and, you know, basically replacing some inner tubes. I mean, flats are the biggest thing. So I, I think I'm really starting to rethink the type of gear I carry and starting to let go of the just in case problems that could mean that I'm carrying just more than I need to. So lighter and smaller for the winter. Next up, wild camping is fun, but respect the space that you choose. I am, I really enjoyed the hell out of not only doing wild camping, but the spot that I chose. I, I really didn't want to disrespect the private land ownership of the area. Um, I found in my spot, the spot that I chose that there were posted no trespassing signs. And, you know, my instinct at the late hour was, well, look, you know, it's really late and nobody's going to know. And I know how I camp and it's going to be respectful. But at the same time, I sort of hesitated and stopped because maybe I'm, a, I'm have an American sensibility of private land ownership and all of that. But, you know, I, I just thought, can I find a spot that isn't on private land? And I think that, and I did, and I found a spot that was sort of in this quasi no man's land, you know, sort of the not illegal spot in between the private land and where the road was. So presumably that was state land because it was a, or probably state land. It was a U.S. highway, U.S. highway 40. And I felt good about that choice. And I think that if that option hadn't been there for me, maybe I would have gone on the private land or maybe I would have kept going. But I do think that it's important to at least think about where you're going to be choosing to wild camp. Obviously, I was only going to be there for a few hours and my intentions were pure. But at the same time, I was also thinking, you know, I own a small piece of land. You know, I've got a, a, a cabin out in West Virginia. How would I feel if somebody just chose to sort of camp in my you know, yard, basically, without my permission? And I thought, yeah, I wouldn't like that too much. Um, I would. Probably if someone asked, say, absolutely go right ahead. But I, I don't think that I would like someone just doing it, thinking that they had the right to do it or whatever. So that's just sort of my opinion on all of this. I think that there's a lot of good opinions on wild camping. And I think it's something that is going to be a point of view that I'm going to be really thinking about a little bit more. I, I do like the idea of uh, federal and state lands and places where you can do legal dispersed camping. Of course, U.S. Forest Service land is a great example of that. I think that's the type of places. Those are the types of places, I should say, subject verb agreement. Hello, that I'm going to be doing more of it. I think I'm going to resist the urge unless it's sort of an emergency situation to camp on private property where I'm not supposed to be. So that's just sort of my takeaway. I'm curious what y'all think about that. Next up, not all people are asshats. Um, there are a lot of jerks out there, but I've met a lot of really cool people. I remember uh, Charles, one of the bus drivers, was just really nice to me. And there were some really kind people out there. And I, I put that in stark contrast to some of the stories we, I've been hearing all through the summer of people who haven't been as kind or haven't been as open. And I, I'm really trying to find the positivity where I can. And I'll be talking about that in a moment as well. But I, I'm happy to say that there are a lot of people out there who are really friendly and really open. And I know that we've all experienced this on our bike tours and everyone has a good story about someone who was really kind to you. But it was just something that was reinforced on this particular trip. And I, I really appreciated that, especially given the breakneck pace that this was all on. Next up is using transit or trains or buses, is absolutely hashtag not cheating. That's sort of my thing with Brock Dittis of the Sprocket Podcast, hashtag not cheating. It, it, 
I think it's it's really you want you use the tools that you want to use. It's your ride. And this ride was very little actual riding. I mean, I think I've joked before that this was more a bike aided transit ride rather than the other way around. And I I don't care. I, I wanted that to be that way. It was part of the proof of concept. And I am really excited about using that more for a bigger tour next year. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what it's going to feel like. I played around with the concept of a cross-country one to celebrate Bike Centennial 40th anniversary. I don't know. We'll think about that some more. But I definitely have come to the point where it's sort of like, I don't need to be a completist. I don't need to bicycle every single square inch of a route to feel like I've done it. It's my ride. It's what I want it to be. So hashtag not cheating. Next up, sleep is really important. This ride, this stunt, this tour was really ultimately more of a test of my ability to handle sleep deprivation rather than anything else. I'll say that again, sleep deprivation. I don't know why I stumbled on that. It it affected the whole day and it affected my whole next day as well because I could barely sleep on the train coming back. It's just it was kind of difficult. And that takes away from me from enjoyment. And when I have less than the amount of sleep I would like to have the, that my body asks for, I just physically I'm not as happy. Basic functions shut down. My ability to sort of, you know, have a coherent sentence goes away. And ultimately that can take away from the enjoyment. And what this is all about is enjoyment. So I think that, again, unless something is really necessary for me to do some kind of crazy, you know, be up for 24 hours straight kind of a thing, you know. I'm going to catch my sleep. I'm going to, you know, not cover as many miles if necessary and, and get more sleep. It just means much more to me than any extra miles that I can get. This was kind of a different. This was a bit of a stunt. I was trying to do it in 24 hours and well, you know, it worked. But sleep is important. And I don't think I'll ever do that again unless, well, I'm compelled to for some other weird reason. Next up, always be prepared for someone to tell you, no, you can't do that. Quick story. So I'm in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm on a bus that is pretty much the most important connection that I had. From that point on, I was very committed to making sure I got to Boston. If I hadn't, I was going to be stranded somewhere in between. And when I got to that bus, although the prior bus, my boy Charles, let me put the bike underneath the bus in sort of the, the classic storage area. This driver was having none of that. He was like, I can't even open that. You're going to have to put it on the front rack. And I had no idea whether or not a bike, a folding bike, a 20 inch wheeled bike would fit. No idea whatsoever. I'd researched it, couldn't find any reference anywhere on that. And so I was like, here goes nothing because I had no idea if it was going to work. Well, turns out it worked and it worked fine. But as many of you who saw and followed the Instagram and all the social media feeds, you know, I put up a picture saying that how many people always feel like you can't trust those racks? I've had Sequoia once fell off of one of those. And so, of course, every time I put a bike on a bus's front bicycle rack, I'm always positive it's going to fall, particularly when it, we're at highway speeds, because, you know, you're just sort of like, how does this work? I <laughs> it's just it just seems like one of those things that should eventually fail. And it, it did. Now, in, in that one instance, I think there was something wrong with the rack and I should have known better and should have moved it to the other spot. But in any event, this worked fine. And I was prepared for someone to tell me no. And I came up with something different. I don't know what would have happened if I was fiddling with that rack and the bike wouldn't have fit. I probably would have had to call it right there. But, you know, I knew that there were options. You know, I knew that, you know what, if the tour ended there, I was prepared for that. So I think that ultimately just being ready for someone to tell you, no, you can't do that. Sometimes you might find a way to bypass that. Sometimes you might be able to comply with it like I did there. And sometimes you might just have to say, you know what, this is it. This is this is the end of the line because of that. I sort of prefer the first one where you can kind of get around what they say, but that's just me. Next one up is a bit of a callback to something I said earlier. I like to bring positivity to the things, and it's really important to me. One thing you probably have noticed on this show, and here we are 29 episodes and, you know, year and a half or so into the show's history. I am by nature not a negative person, and I find that negativity is something that I try to rebel against a little bit, which may in its own sense be negative, in which case I'm a giant hypocrite. Hi. But 
I, I just think that when there are things that defy your expectations or there are things that are maybe going against the grain for you, I think it's a lot better to bring a positive attitude towards it rather than just sort of shake your fist against the, the against the world and and go against it. And I find that by being flexible and by being a little bit easygoing, that I find that in bike touring in particular, I'm much happier as a result. So if something doesn't go my way, uh, you know what? I'm just going to roll with the punches. And I think that the Hartford example is a really good one. You know, I wasn't going to just sit there and argue with the bus driver. I'm like, okay, well, let me see what I can figure out. And you know what? If it doesn't work out the way that I want, I'm going to figure out something else. And if it doesn't work out and then I have to end this trip, you know what? So be it too. And I'm not going to get angry and I'm not going to get upset. And I think that that's just the attitude that I like to bring generally to bike touring and maybe generally in life as well. I try to avoid conflict where possible. And I think that I'm happier for that. And I don't know. This is sort of a takeaway that had larger life implications, I think. But it just was something that I was reflecting on as a result of this entire tour. So positivity. Check in on that. Last but not least, I'm going to be using these lessons, all of these lessons, in a bigger tour next year. And I talked about it a few minutes ago. So this is a bit of a repeat. But, you know, I think that there's a lot of things in here. You know, packing lighter, doing some more wild camping using the transit systems and Amtrak throughout the country to maybe bike where I want to bike and skip the parts that I don't want to. And I did it to a certain extent last year on the West Coast tour where I skipped a certain section of of California just because I wanted to try Amtrak. Well, I still consider that I bike the entire Pacific Coast. So I think I might just do more of that for next year's tours and think about the places that I want to go to and say, well, I want to bike here and here, and I don't have to do them in two separate trips or have one enormously long trip to be able to do those two places, I can do a fast forward. And I think that's an okay thing. And I think it's all about the adventure, focusing on the places that you want to be biking. And you know what? I think I'm going to be using a lot of those lessons that I learned on this trip definitely next year. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available. 